7%, 45% this week, Anand, yes. some of these so all are these Atmanirbhar yeah. trades. Yes, you know, defense uh, theme, etc. And you know, all of these. Yeah. Uh, by the way, you know, just... the Bharat Forge trade, no? it's again a defense. Exactly, trade. exactly. Uh, and you know what, just keep an eye on Tata Motors because uh, that's the one which is now beginning to move. Uh, you know, of course, Ashok, Ashok Leyland is in FNO band, so, uh, you know, so the other uh, CB player, uh, that's okay. the move. In fact, that's uh, also global play. That's actually looking like, to me, one of the charts of the day. Uh, early in the morning. Okay. But uh, gentlemen, thanks a lot for taking us through the market opening. Uh, we'll of course come back to you uh, later in the day. For now, Manish Gunwani is joining us, CIO Equity Investments at Nippon India Mutual Fund. Manish, good morning. Thanks a lot for joining us. Uh, it's been a trending upward market and especially on the broader market, we've seen a party out there. Uh, uh, are you still getting enough themes, enough stocks to add into your portfolio? Or are you raising cash levels? Manish, good morning. Uh, if uh, you can hear me, I was asking you about your thoughts on the kind of rally that we have seen and is it still good to buy? I think near, near term there could be some consolidation, I feel, because the market on aggregate earnings is a bit expensive. If you look at the Nifty EPS for FY22, which could be somewhere around 575 to 650, um, you're clearly trading at much above historical multiples. I'm talking about FI22 because 21 is going to be uh, distorted a lot. Um, so you're looking at almost two year forward uh, multiple, uh, which is uh, kind of 17, 18 times, which is quite high. Um, so I would think that the headline index uh, probably uh, should consolidate here for some time. But I think. A lot of people are looking at stocks from a near-term perspective. If you go back to Jan 2018 and compare the broader market, you've seen a lot of mid and small caps still down 30, 40, 60% from that peak. And it's almost two years, so the book value, the capacity has expanded, et cetera. Then clearly um, you're not so uh, cautious in the sense that I, Bottom up, we're still able to uh, very comfortably look at stocks and say that over the next two, three years, can these stocks give 50 to 100 percent return? There are a lot of potential candidates for that kind of return. So is it a market that as a stock picker, uh, you are very, very uh, frustrated? Definitely not. I think uh, it's a market you're pretty comfortable buying a lot of stocks bottom up, actually. Although... I think the Nifty or the BSE 100 looks a bit expensive. Okay. Now, actually, I was uh, coming to that. Uh, I mean, since, you know, this doesn't measure in an index sense. Uh, Manisha, good morning and thank you for joining. If you looked at it from the 2017 levels, the mid-cap index is still about 25% off. I think we went to 20,000, right, mm -hmm. at that time. So we are at 16,000 now. The index itself is still uh, uh, off. So you think it has lots more legs to run? Yeah, I think uh, clearly what has happened is over last three years, uh, the domestic economy has got repeated shocks, whether it's the NBFC crisis or COVID. So what you're seeing across the market is that a lot of IT, pharma, chemical stocks are have doubled in the last three, four years. But at the same time, a lot of stocks in the auto cement, industrials, real estate space have half. So it's a kind of polarized market, obviously. Um, the later half is where I think there is um, interesting uh, stock picking left uh, because clearly uh, today, if you see the ask rate on a lot of these companies, um, even if the domestic economy were to normalize in two years, as I said, you can still make 50 to 100% return in two to three years, which is obviously very healthy in this low rate kind of uh, global environment and domestic environment now. Um, so that is why I'm saying that, yes, the headline index looks expensive, but at the same time, uh, when you're picking stocks, um, there is reasonable margin of safety and you're able to buy with fair amount of conviction. Okay. Manish, uh, you know, good morning. Let me actually uh, uh, drill you a little more since mid-caps uh, are the toast and that is the big theme. Uh, it's, it's easy to also get burnt in this momentum, right? So when you're looking at some of your mid-cap holdings, what are the sectors or what are the themes that you're most convinced of? I know it's a lot of it is a completely bottom-up, but in general, any preferences? 
So as I mentioned, uh, where we see value from a two to three year perspective is a lot of these uh, domestic um, sector aligned, um, domestic economy aligned sectors, um, autos, financials, real estate, industrials, consumables, a lot of these uh, sectors. Um, and some part of uh, mid-cap IT and pharma still looks interesting because uh, clearly over there also the large caps have largely outperformed the mid-cap. Um, so especially in IT, I think some of the mid-caps still look interesting. Uh, but yeah, uh, as a basket, I think the domestic economy aligned sectors today uh, as i said you know um, even if you even if you were to assume that the demand for some of these segments like commercial vehicles or cement were just to normalize um, then a lot of the mid cap stocks in these um, sectors uh, they're trading way cheaper than historical valuation which is very unlike the headline index where most of the quality stocks are um, quite above the price earning multiples, which they've traded historically. So, so there is a bit of divergence still. Um, the mid-cap index, as you pointed out, recently has done well. But again, um, if you look from a Jan 2018 perspective, um, it's not done anything at all. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. You know, Manish, let me put it this way. You know, we are discussing too large a basket uh, and uh, uh, that's why Sulubi is asking you, where can you, where may you burn your fingers? Can you tell us which part of the unlock trade is impressing you most? Is it hotels? Is it quick service restaurants? Is it uh, uh, aviation? Uh, is it retail stores? Defense, the Atmanirbhar uh, play, which is the most impressive mid-cap theme for you? In general, uh, Lada, I'm a bit more on the consumer side okay. uh, because I think the balance sheet is better on the consumer side. Um, so I would go something uh, which is consumer oriented like retailing um, okay. rather than to be kind of sector at this point of time. Okay. Okay. What about metals? Uh, it's a big play which has happened already uh, in the cyclicals. But, uh, you know, perhaps valuation-wise still quite okay. So, any, any thoughts here? Uh, are you adding any stocks here in, in this list? I would say we have a mildly positive view. Obviously, stocks from bottom have done well. Um, but, and I think it's a very um, risky trade to catch. But, uh, and this has happened for the last two, three years. But at various points of time, uh, the world is looking at a point where, you know, the big emerging market cycle takes off. So, so we all know that, uh, you know, the dollar and U.S. economy dominating the global economy. Um, this goes around in eight, ten year cycles. Um, so 95 to 2002 and 2010 to 2020 till today has been a very dollar do dominated, U.S. economy dominated um, cycle. And Everyone's looking for that reversal, which will bring us back to the 2002 to 2010 kind of cycle, where emerging market currencies do well, commodities do well, global growth picks up. Now, um, there are some green shoots of that cycle coming back. Now, obviously, over the last two, three years, as I said, a lot of times these green shoots haven't fructified. But if this carries on to become one of the larger cycles, and obviously metals have a long, long way to go. So they can still be multi-baggers from here. Um, so, so near term, maybe again, because it bounced back, we are a bit cautious. But overall, I'll still be, be quite positive on that space. Okay, so we have to see if the pandemic plays the role that 9-11 played uh, in 2001 yeah. and unleashed uh, you know, a long period of low rates. But uh, will you buy on that hope? Uh, I think that was Anuj's question. Will you wait for metals or is it it's not a trade now? No, we are um, equal way to overweight metal. We are definitely not underweight largely. Um, see, one is the macro context, but one is also bottom of valuation, right? So if you see on replacement cost or um, normalized EBITDA, what these stocks are building in, uh, they're quite cheap from that perspective. So the ask rate. The macro forecasting is obviously a bit 
tricky at times, but but the ask rate of what stocks are building in is what um, we have to focus in as well. So clearly, the ask rate on FMCG IT, a lot of spaces in pharma is quite high at this point of time, whereas in uh, metals, the ask rate is not that high. Okay, so metals could still be compounders from here. Manish, you know that classic uh, growth versus value debate perhaps is illustrated by you know two clear sectors. There's one which is internet slash telecom on one side, and then there is the the cyclicals, the the you know durable stocks or the economy facing stocks, the BHELs of the world, and they've been underperformers for so long. What are your thoughts on both ends of the spectrum? Well, I I have a kind of nuanced view on this. I'm I'm not so heavy on the Capex team to be honest, uh, because I think it'll take time. Um, this COVID shock, um, while while the unprecedented kind of stimulus has elevated pain in the asset markets and in the, in the real economy, definitely it will carry on for two three years. I think the need to get fiscal deficits back globally. The private sector psychology of spending on discretionary items has been hurt. So I'm not so much uh, on the heavy capex team. Uh, a lot of consumable um, industrials, I think, will do well. Um, but but I think Indian household balance sheet, uh, to me, on an aggregate at least, looks very fine. Uh, the ask rate on a lot of consumption sectors, which are discretionary, is quite low. So I would say that. Uh, Yes, um, you know, um, cyclicals uh, look interesting, as I said, but but I think uh, I would prefer on, uh, being in cyclicals where uh, we are facing the consumer balance sheet rather than the private sector balance sheet or the government balance sheet. Okay, but I believe you are now you know coming out with an NFO as well on uh, a multi-asset fund, uh, Manish. Uh, so. Tell us, uh, what would be the approach and uh, why in this kind of a market? Well, what you've seen um, with COVID recently, but over last many years, is definitely that, uh, as I said, macro forecasting is very difficult. So as predicting how assets perform, asset classes perform, is uh, very, very difficult. If you'd asked anyone at the beginning of this calendar year uh, about equities, everyone was feeling very good after the US China trade war got over. Um, and, and no one was noticing gold, but the way last um, year has panned out, the calendar year, obviously gold has done spectacularly well. So uh, the point being that um, if you can't predict uh, asset class movements very accurately, I think the best thing to do then is to have a proportion of asset classes which uh, make long-term sense. So uh, we believe that in the long-term, domestic equity still uh, will provide the highest nominal return. So that's the biggest part of this fund. So uh, I think uh, what we're saying here is that uh, have a fixed set of asset classes and hold them for the long term. Don't try to time markets too much, but at the same time, uh, whatever asset class does well, you take some profit on it, move to asset class which doesn't do well, and add some weight to that. So this in a nutshell is what this product does, that uh, it has a definite uh, proportion of asset classes, there are four asset classes. Um, one is domestic equity, second is foreign equities, third is gold, and fourth is debt. And we have um, fixed proportions for these. And periodically, we keep rebalancing to get these fixed uh, proportions back, which means to say, if one asset class like, let's say, gold as well, its weight goes up, then we sell it and get it back to the original level. So there is a bit of valuation discipline built in that way. Manish, Manish, so, are you going to invest more of this fund's money in FANG stocks, US equities, or will you put more money to work here in India? Simple question. <laughs> No, so, so the point is, see, three years back, if, if you'd asked me honestly, I would have said India, but it hasn't worked, right? I mean, uh, let's let's be honest. I mean, uh, some of these things, very global trends are difficult to forecast. So point being that, yes, I think India should have a higher weight, but should uh, if global stocks be zero in entire net worth of any investor? I don't think so. so that's the point that... Uh, at some level, uh, yes, you need to take calls, but I think the core of the portfolio of any investor has to be um, disciplined in terms of asset allocation and needs to have a bit of everything, right? 
Um, you can obviously tactically time with the asset class, you will go overweight or underweight, but, um, but the discipline of asset allocation says that have a certain weight in every asset class, and that, that is very crucial. And that is what we are trying to bring with this uh, multi-asset fund of ours that have a core um, allocation to uh, the big asset classes, the four big asset classes which we have in this fund. And then obviously on top of it, you can build a thematic fund, a fully diversified fund. But, but I think we need to be in these four asset classes to a certain extent all the time. <clears throat> okay, Manish, it's always a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Have a great weekend. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, the markets are still holding up excellently well. The early morning trade has actually worked in favor of the big boys.